but I mean like Facebook and supercomputers. So before I do that, let me introduce the concept of virtual screening and its relevance in the pharmaceutical industry. Basically, developing new drugs is super expensive. It takes billions of dollars and years of research for a company like Pfizer to roll out just one drug into the market. So one way to save a lot of time and money is to simulate these molecular interactions between a drug and a receptor in a computer. If a drug binds very strongly to a cell, and it's likely to do, sorry, if it binds strongly to a receptor, it's likely to do something beneficial for the cell. So in my project, I'm studying three different targets with potential therapeutic uses. The first one is HIV-1 integris, which is a promising target for an AIDS vaccine because HIV, the HIV virus needs this protein in order to integrate itself into the host genome. The second one is acetylcholinesterase, which can be targeted for treating the symptoms of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. And finally, the telomere RNA quadruplex, which is sort of a molecule that I've been personally interested in in the past because I've done research on telomeres and quadruplexes. It's a little weird, but no. <laughs> so I went to Costco and I went to the supercomputing section and I, and I asked the sales associate, Hi, can I buy a supercomputer for my science fair project? And she said, Oh, sure, that'll be $25,000. And I was like, what? $25,000? I can't afford that. Actually, I never went to the super convenience store, but still, the problem remains that I needed a way to do virtual screening on the budget of an unemployed high school student. <laughs> so, one possible solution, actually, is to use volunteer computing. There's projects like Folding at Home and Setting at Home that let you download some software to your computer, and you can donate your computing cycles to power parts of this project. Unfortunately, in order to participate in a project like this, you have to go to the Boeing website, download the client, and extract the package, install, uh, read the manual, install the software, bypass your firewall, join a project, set up an account, and run to errors like these. It's really <laughs> tedious, and it really limits the numbers of potential users that can con contribute to these projects. So one of the objectives of my project was to find a way to overcome this accessibility barrier, while at the same time overcoming the cost barrier as well. So for my project, I'm targeting a non-technical, but much larger volunteer community, and that community is Facebook. We're going to target Facebook for a virtual screen. Well, why Facebook? Because Facebook is an incubator for viral internet phenomena. I mean, we spent a lot of time on Facebook. In fact, <laughs> Americans spend 54 billion minutes every month on Facebook, just, you know, wasting time. So, <laughs> we actually built a really, really powerful supercomputer. So that's where my project comes in. I created a Facebook application that puts virtual screening completely within the web browser. It's powered entirely by HTML5, no setup, and it's platform independent. In fact, you can actually run it on your iPad. So we run all, we put all the docking algorithms completely within JavaScript, actually. And since 2009, web browsers like Firefox and Google Chrome have really pushed the boundaries of what web browsers can do with HTML5. One example is JavaScript Web Workers, which just allows us to run the synchronous JavaScript threads within the browser and do intense number crunching. And within these web workers, we can use cross-domain resource scripting to get, serv um, to get files over the internet, and that allows us to save a lot of uh, server space and money. So, in order to find out which molecule binds the strongest to these, um, these receptors, I implemented the general amber force field completely in Scratch, from, in JavaScript. Basically, what the general amber force field is, it's a it's fitting quantum mechanical data to um, harmonic force functions, and that allows us to approximate how much potential energy a receptor has um, in position with a, a compound. High energies are bad because they're thermodynamically unlikely to happen. So in order to port this gas force field to my project called Social Docking, I studied the Open Babel software, and this was one of the harder parts of my project because OpenDable is a really complex program that's been in development for 10 years, and so one of the harder parts was reverse engineering um, GAF and studying how the force field works. But I got it eventually. So the first part of this force field is we have to assign atom types. I assigned aromatic flags using Google's rule to count high orbitals, and then I used smart space atom assignment based on subgraph searching of this chemical. So for example, this atom that you see in the middle is a carbon atom that's bonded to a hydrogen atom, one other atom, and two EWD branches. And it has this very special atom type and special force coefficients, and this goes on for a bunch of different kinds of atoms. So the force field is very specific. The next step is to distribute partial charges to the atoms. I use gas figures partial charge equalization method to basically assign uh, elect uh, electronegativities based on hybridization and then fan it out uh, in an iterative process. 
So returning to the force field, we can actually now compute the potential energy of a uh, ligand, uh, ligand's um, conformations. In the interest of time, I won't go over what these equations mean, but if there's any questions at the end, I can explain what these mean in more detail. So we now have a method of sampling potential energy. But what we really want to find is the lowest point on this energy surface where the uh, ligand binds the strongest to the receptor, its optimum pose. In order to do this, we have to consider that uh, every single atom can move independently because ligands and receptors are flexible. So we end up with a hypersurface hyper with thousands of degrees of freedom. And what we want to find is the lowest point on the surface. And that's a computationally, met, computationally difficult problem since we have a lot of dimensions. So for my pro uh, project, I implemented the Metropolis Monte Carlo search to basically find the minimum point, and I used the Metropolis criterion to select poses based on a Boltzmann probability distribution. And the Metropolis criterion allows us to stochastically tunnel through local minima and reach the optimal minima of this hypersurface. So we also have to account for entropy effects. Instead of, because web browsers don't have enough memory to store the entire uh, ensemble for entropy analysis, what I did was I approximated entropy using the average of the Boltzmann distribution rather than the minimum post. So analogies, if you think of a ligand as a slinky and like the hypersurface as a staircase, we care more about how many steps the slinky can fall down the stairs usually rather than what's the lowest possible step it can actually get to. So that's basically how the entropy was approximated. Results. Here's a demo of the social docking application running within a web browser to show how easy it is. It just takes three simple steps. Step one, navigate to the application. Step two, click on the start button. And just kidding, there's no step three because that's literally how easy it is to get started. <laughs> All you have to do is click the button and your web browser automatically turns it in the browser. Once it finishes analyzing one molecule, it plugs right on. So, I ran this project over the course of two weeks, starting in January, and who used the app? Well, it's reached over 700 unique users in over 10 different countries, and this just shows how powerful Facebook is as a method of getting the word out about this kind of project. If you Google social docking, various pages will link you straight to the application, so it's a good way for social media to, you know, converge on the site. Now, we also want to check for measurement accuracy, so I compared my force field to the, um, to the GAF implementation inside of OpenBabel. As you can see here, the columns are divided into the, en the energy components, such as electrostatics, van der Waals, bond, tor bond torsion, angle bending, bond stretching. And as you can see, for this particular molecule, the social docking force field and the OpenBabel force field have the exact same measurements. Now, I repeated this for 30 more compounds, and it turns out that the average is about 1%. And the bars are a little small, but basically they're from side to side. Here are the virtual screening results, showing the distributions of energy profiles generated for the 10,500 molecules docked in this project. I did a linear correlation test with the energy and molecular properties provided by the database I used with, uh, for chemicals. And as you can see here, there's no strong correlation, but that's good because we don't want the screening to bias a selective compound based on these general properties alone. These general properties are actually dependent on the Pitsby's rule for drug likeness, but other than that, we want more specificity with the actual structure of the atom itself. So I identified the best binding compounds for these three structures. As you can see here, virtual screening really limits, uh, it pairs down the number of potential compounds we have to test. So we can prioritize on these compounds rather than wasting our time with thousands of bad ligands. So exactly how cost-effective is social docking? I mean, like, cost-effectiveness is sort of a relative term, as we found with supercomputers. But I think we can all agree that zero dollars is a pretty good price tag. <laughs> this hand, the server handles, uh, the Google App Engine server that I hosted this on was free, and it comes with really limited memory, but because all the work is put within the browser, it's really uh, efficient. So here's a recap of the implementation challenges I faced with this project. I created a low-cost, I mean, zero-cost um, Facebook application that basically puts virtual screening entirely within the browser. In order to do resource management, I used some third-party web APIs, and um, to approximate entropy, I used Boltzmann average rather than the actual full ensemble analysis. So here we have 
a novel web-based distributed virtual screening framework. And we found out that the force field was accurate, and we've identified top priority ligands. But the applications of this project actually extend far beyond that, because for the very first time ever, re independent researchers can put together supercomputing projects for as little as zero dollars. So this can actually be extended to projects like weather forecasting, analyzing satellite data. Any kind of computational problem can now be solved using cheap distributed computing. Social docking is an ongoing project, and even as I speak, there's people continuing to contribute modules for, uh, study modules for this study. One important improvement is to add receptor flexibility with the study. I did all the research and programming by myself, and I asked some questions at the beginning of months of my project, some, you know, and some stupid questions on mailing lists and programming forums. So, oh, one more thing. Social docking was released as open source, and you guys are all welcome to download the code and get your free super computer. Thank you. You know, the question is whether you have to have the page up. And the answer, the short answer is you don't have to look at the page. You can just like minimize it or you know, put it out of the way as long as the page is open in your browser. So the question was, how did I get my data in it? And um, maybe I should kind of explain how the data gets used in the first place. So what I did was I got some data from the Zinc Free Chemical Database. I put it on a Google App Engine server, just the names of the chemicals. And what happens when the user opens the page, the chemical gets sent to their computer. They do some number crunching. They send the answer back. They get a new one. And so all the data is stored on a server I posted to Google. But does the user see what calculations are being done, or is that completely unclear to them? So the question was whether the user gets to see any of the calculations being done. And the answer is sort of. Um, as you can, let me go back to this slide. So when the user is running the app, actually, this energy profile is being generated that shows the descending, being, the, the Monte Carlo simulation is running the descending energy. Um, down, so the user gets to see the energies. But in regards to the actual like molecular computations, it's all hidden in the web browser. So the question is whether the user's Facebook or computer gets tied up when this happens, and the answer is yes if they are also trying to run like game at the same time. But for most practical uses, people don't use all their computing power. So the idea of this project is to utilize the extra CPU. Any other questions from the judges? What for the audience? Yeah. You, you referred to uh, applying it to weather forecasting uh, with the chemicals. You went to a database and included a chemical. Uh, would you use natural phenomena, uh, somebody in China or somebody in uh, Beirut or somebody just uh, applying their weather and then analyzing or how, how would it work? Well, this, okay, so the question was, if I were to apply this framework to weather forecasting, how would such a system be designed? And um, I haven't come up with an answer, but I haven't come up with an answer to that question, because whether you have to, if one has to figure out how to sort of map reduce the, um, the problem that we're trying to tackle, so that it can be divided up into computable chunks by users. So I don't know too much about weather forecasting, but I know that it is a very computationally expensive process because there are thermodynamic simulations that you have to run very similar to this project. So, but with this project, it's nice because chemicals, the work can be divided up per chemical that you want to screen. So there's any more questions? <clears throat> Audience? Has anybody verified um, the chemicals that you saw would be good matches? Has there been any uh, actual experiments to check your computational work? So the question was whether anyone has actually verified the, um, the data here. Um, and the answer is I haven't checked myself. Um, currently, no one has actually ever docked the terra molecule in a virtual screen. But I have not verified the uh, HIV-1 tigrase or the acetylcholine esterase molecules.
So the question was if there's a speed difference in um, how fast an iPad can compute it versus a gaming rig. And the answer is yes, there's certainly a difference. Um, a gaming rig would definitely crunch these chemicals out faster, but how the system works is that as soon as it finishes one, it just fetches another from the server. So it just, you know, whatever you've got, basically. Thank you, Rick.